The farm economy, trade, and rural broadband are just some of the topics that would have been discussed as members of the young ag professionals were set to travel on their leadership trip to Washington. As with most everything in our world today, we're helping those new and beginning farmers have their concerns addressed virtually. Joining us this week is Dr. John Newton. He's the chief economist with the American Farm Bureau Federation, and Cody Lyons is managing director of advocacy and political affairs for the American Farm Bureau Federation as well. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. You know, I, before we got started here, we talked about the energy and enthusiasm young ag professionals have for the industry and bring to Washington. And I know that you guys uh, love visiting with them year in and year out. And this is disappointing that they can't make the trip. Yeah, I, I would probably say it's disappointing for us not to be able to see uh, our members face to face. It, it's a different environment, definitely a struggle for a lot of us. And, and um, doing these type presentations and meeting and sharing the information virtually is, is something we've had to adjust to. Uh, but I, I would definitely say I look forward to the opportunity getting together again with a group in a in a in a conference room or meeting setting and being able to have that interaction and feedback. I, I think it's important for me. I value that that opportunity. Dr. Newton, you know, when it comes to young ag professionals and their concerns, you know, a lot of them are similar to to farmers that uh, are of an older generation. But there are some differences in some of the things they look at and, and are concerned about for well into the future. Well, I think, you know, it's a certainly a, a very challenging time uh, in the farm economy for all producers, whether they're uh, beginning young farmers and ranchers or uh, more seasoned uh, in their career as a, as a farmer and rancher. Uh, but some of our young folks, the, some of the challenges that have emerged, uh, access to capital, access to, to loans, uh, access to farmland, uh, those, those can be particularly challenging uh, in a down farm economy. So I have fielded questions from our young ag professionals from all over the state, and I'm going to pose them to you uh, here today uh, for you to uh, address them and, and let them know kind of what to look for as, as they uh, think about some of the things that are on their mind, not just COVID-19 related, but for the agriculture economy as a whole. And so uh, this first question comes from Megan and Tyrone Brandon. They're in Tuscarawas County. Uh, they want to know how much of an impact the coronavirus food assistance program is having on farmers who have struggled during COVID-19 and then I think this follow-up will be for you, Cody. Uh, will this program alone be enough? And, and Dr. Newton, we'll start with you. Well, what we've seen uh, so far through last week, about $9.2 billion uh, in assistance has gone out through the CFAP program. Uh, that assistance has been provided to cattle producers, dairy producers, non-specialty crops, specialty crops, aquaculture, fresh cut flowers, a variety of commodities and farmers are eligible uh, for the program. USDA did set aside uh, more than $15 billion uh, to help producers impacted by COVID-19. Uh, the deadline for this program is September 11th, uh, and it's certainly not enough. I think the Secretary of Agriculture understands that, uh, and last week even signaled that after uh, this current sign-up window closes, they, they plan to roll out uh, a second stimulus package for agriculture uh, to help producers cover losses that happened uh, in the back half of the second quarter and that continue uh, today. Uh, not only that, uh, you know, Congress is still uh, debating what the next st stimulus package will include, uh, and we hope it includes additional assistance for our agricultural producers. Yeah, I, I would absolutely agree with, with John. If this is uh, probably the first step. Uh, we want to see what kind of the second step is going to look like. Um, you know, it, it kind of gets into my area that the, the reality of what's happening on the ground is coming right up against to the political reality of, um, you know, Congress is out uh, this week, the Senate will come back next week, and the, the House is not expected to come back till mid-September. So there's a limited number of days to which, you know, they could get something done and need to get something done to help uh, farmers and ranchers in Ohio as well as around the country uh, before they start getting into, you know, complete campaign mode. Uh, and then what does that look like after uh, you know, after election time, election day. Um, so, you know, there, there is that reality of the need happening on the ground on farms and ranches, uh, and it's coming right up against that that polit political timeline that it continues to be shortened by by campaign period. I think this is the importance of any farmer rancher being able to talk to their legislator and tell them what those needs are, because if, if, if legislators don't hear from constituents on what those needs are, they don't know what they need to do. They don't know the pressing need that, that needs to happen in September before they leave D.C. and spend the rest of their time uh, in Ohio until mid-November or, or later. 
And Cody Lyons, Dr. Newton mentioned uh, the deadline is coming up on the 11th of this month, and he also mentioned the wide range of, of farmers and producers that can take part. I think, you know, that was one of the issues that we're seeing is that a lot of these farmers have never been uh, qualified for a federal program like this and, and may not even know that they can get involved. Is that something that we're seeing across the country? I, I would say so. I'm sorry, go ahead, John. Oh, no, I'll, I'll just say without a doubt, we sent a letter to the secretary about three weeks ago pointing out that many of the specialty crop producers have never had to visit with an FSA agent, some of our livestock folks, uh, specialty livestock, aquaculture, uh, outside of your traditional row crops and dairy producers, uh, many farmers haven't had to visit FSA uh, to this scale and to get the assistance that they need. Uh, it's also a pretty cumbersome process. There's a lot of documentation that you need to provide and fill out on these forms to get assistance. I think that's one of the reasons why we think not all the money's gone out the door just yet, and that's why we asked for an extension, uh, which the secretary did grant. Yeah, this is definitely a challenge for farmers and ranchers to get to that point. If you've never had to do it before, it, it, it's something that you need to do in order to get that assistance. Next question comes from Adam and Jess Campbell. They're in Warren County, and I know why they asked this question, because they have a business of their own down there. They, they want to know if, uh, and I think, Dr. Newton, this is best suited for you. Do you think the surge in buying goods at a more local level will continue even after the pandemic subsides? Well, I think, uh, you know, more than anything uh, that we've seen, uh, one of the positive stories that we've seen is that uh, consumers are, are very interested now where their food comes from. They were beforehand. Uh, but now they really want to know the farmer. They want to know where their meat's coming from, where their dairy's coming from. Uh, so I certainly think it, it, it has the potential to continue uh, well into the future. Uh, I think one of the, the, you know, the interesting thing we've seen is uh, an interest in local meat processing, for example. And so uh, that can certainly continue. We're working to get some of the regulatory barriers taken down uh, to facilitate some of these smaller meat packers continuing to operate. Uh, but at the end of the day, if, if consumers want that, they want that local food, they're going to have to pay for it. And I think that's that's what, uh, you know, economies of scale, some of these larger businesses, uh, because consumers have wanted lower price food. And so uh, if consumers want to go more local, more regional, uh, there is going to be added costs in the supply chain. Cameron Reinhardt is in Fayette County. Uh, he wants to know, and I'll have, I'll have a follow-up for you, Cody, but this is for Dr. Newton as well. How has trade been impacted by COVID-19 so far? Well, I think when you when you consider that that most of the world's economies went into a recession during the second quarter, uh, you would you would think that trade would slow down, and that's exactly what we've seen. Ag trade is down. Uh, United States ag trade is down about four percent. I think in many of our top markets, whether it's Mexico, Canada, Japan, South Korea, uh, ag exports are a little bit slower through the first half of this year. Uh, they're up about four hundred and thirty million dollars or so to China. Uh, but that's in large part due to their uh, phase one uh, commitments, as well as the need to purchase additional livestock uh, products to recover from African swine fever. But uh, we have seen some headwinds. USDA does project for uh, you know GDP growth to remain negative, uh, but we do see uh, exports improving by about $5 billion in fiscal year 21 as economies around the world start to bounce back. Cody Lyons, you look at the first part of this year, we had just signed the first ever trade agreement of its kind with China. Uh, July 1, the new USMCA with Mexico and Canada went into effect. There was a lot of great things happening on the trade front as coronavirus started to come on. Uh, that momentum, of course, was, was uh, halted, uh, not to a complete stop, but a uh, pretty slow pace. As we start to come out of this and, and things start to improve, are we gonna see the benefits of those trade deals? I believe so. I, I think we'll start seeing some of the, um, um, let me back up. If, if, if Trump administration is reelected, uh, then I think you'll, you'll see more um, uh, unilateral type trade agreements kind of continue. I think that's where his administration is going. That's, that's really what they want to go. I think the focus will continue to be on China just as it's a big market. Um, for products, but there'll be other areas that, that the Trump administration will want to continue to see trade agreements come about. If, however, there is a change in, in administrations, then I think you'll see a, a, a difference in kind of how the philosophies of a Biden administration will come into play with trade. I think there'll be a lot more multilateral uh, agreements kind of come into play. I think you'll start seeing uh, many nations' agreements come into what the U.S. wants to do. 
I still think agriculture is going to be key, you know, in that. It, it probably won't be a lot of headlines, but it's going to continue to be a, one of the key factors in in um, in any of the trade agreements and those trade negotiations. Um, trade is vital. We know it's vital for any agricultural uh, products to be shipped overseas. It helps the economy. It helps with a variety of different other uh, aspects, whether it be local, um, uh, but definitely from a national perspective. So it, I think the trade agreements are going to continue to be key, no matter what this continuation of a Trump administration or Biden administration. I th just think it's more a factor of what, uh, how it's going to look and what priority it, it will be given. John Newton is the chief economist with the American Farm Bureau Federation. Cody Lyons is managing director of advocacy and political affairs with AFBF. Joining us this week as we bring DC to our Ohio Weekly and our young ag professionals who about this time would have been, been making the trip uh, into the nation's capital to uh, lobby uh, for concerns and issues that they have on their mind. And we're bringing those answers to them this week on the show. Uh, Dr. Newton, this one will be for you from Charlie and Casey Ellington in Stark County. Uh, they wanna know what your overall outlook is for the farm economy. Well, I think we've certainly seen some headwinds uh, with the, with COVID-19. You mentioned the optimism that we had with these trade deals going back to March. I think folks were, were optimistic on USMCA with China, with Japan. Uh, we renegotiated trade in 50% of our markets. And so uh, we knew that we were going to have a big crop and, and record livestock production this year, but we thought demand uh, would, would really carry the day uh, due to these trade agreements. Now, there's a lot of concern over the fate of the ethanol industry uh, as, as folks are not driving as much. Uh, that has a trickle down impact in the, in the corn. Uh, we've seen you know, some, some rough weather conditions of late uh, that's led to uh, some higher prices. But I think when you think more broadly about the future of the, the ag economy, where's that next big demand pool gonna come from? Uh, there's not another ethanol on the horizon. Uh, hopefully we continue, as Cody mentioned, getting better access in more markets around the world. Uh, but one area that I think can and will likely become a revenue generator for our agricultural producers uh, is, is, is in the area of carbon sequestration and carbon markets. We're uniquely positioned uh, to, to sequester carbon in the soil, to uh, convert waste products into an energy product. Uh, we just need to find a way to make it economically sustainable uh, find a way for, for public dollars to make those investments uh, in the ag community. And I, I think that's something that uh, many farmers and ranchers look at as a potential revenue stream uh, in the future if we can figure it out. I'll combine this uh, next question. We had two very similar questions from Kristen and Justin Dickey in Henry County and Aaron Harder in Lucas County. The, the gist of their question is, uh, what should they be uh, looking for as far as what's being addressed inside the Beltway that young farmers should keep an eye on. I know when you guys brief them when they come to DC, uh, you talk about everything from uh, rural broadband to mental health. What are some of the things on the radar inside the Beltway these days? I, I mean, I, I think as John mentioned, when you're looking at, um, uh, you know, potentially what a new administration may may bring, I think it's going to be a lot in that kind of area of, of um, Carbon sequestration, sustainability. What does that mean? What what exactly can agriculture uh, be at the forefront? Uh, what 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 are some answers agriculture can can do in those regards? Now there'll be some things that are going to be, you know, tough to hear, tough to stomach. Um, but there's you know the pros and cons if you look at the overall big picture of what that may look like. And I think this is kind of the big question: what it may look like. I, I think one of the biggest things is uh, you know depending on what the outcome of the election turns out to be. Young farmers and ranchers continue to uh, um, talk to their lawmakers and need to build those relationships so that when those lawmakers have a question or they need an answer on something, they know who to, who to turn to. Uh, you know, when, when I worked on the Hill, that's one of the biggest things. You had that list of people who you knew and trusted. So if you didn't understand something, you need to have better understanding of an issue. That That, that is who you call. Uh, and, and, you know, to be honest, congressional staffers who are, you know, talented in their late 20s or so, they want to be able to talk to someone who they can relate to. That's going to be young agricultural professionals. They're going to have the same background, same understanding. They'll be able to have a conversation uh, very easily and build that trust and relationship. And that, you know, I think becomes key. So, you know, if, no matter what the administration is going to be, no matter what Congress is going to look like next time around, getting involved and having those conversations needs to be at the forefront because, we're looking at policy that could go 
once one end of the spectrum to the other, continue kind of the way we're going, could shift completely into a completely different direction. And farmers and ranchers need to be able to kind of get involved and, and relay what they want to have happen no matter who is in office. Dr. Newton, final thoughts for our young ag professionals. I think it's kind of piggybacking off of what, what Cody talked about. Young farmers, young ag professionals, they're, they're incredibly innovative, resilient. Uh, identifying the regulatory hurdles that you that you see that's that's preventing your operation uh, from being more successful, uh, any challenges that stand in your way, and, and uh, through our grassroots process, elevate it, elevate it to the state, elevate it to the national level, uh, so that we can continue to be an ally of, of all farmers and ranchers, but especially our next generation of, of leaders as they come through the Farm Bureau family. Dr. John Newton is Chief Economist with the American Farm Bureau Federation. Cody Lyons uh, works in D.C. for AFBF as well. They're Managing Director of Activacy and Political Affairs. Gentlemen, I really appreciate you both being here and bringing D.C. to Ohio and our young ag professionals since they couldn't make the trip to visit you. Uh, appreciate the insights and uh, thank you for your time. Thank, thank you. you.